Good evening everybody, it's Victoria and Karen here to talk to you tonight and Fluffy's here as well. Mm -hmm. uh, Fluffy was just at Universal with us yesterday yeah. and he did very well so he, Karen stayed the night and her and Rich have been working on building a platform, which I put a picture of oh, okay. up online, yeah. uh, under my personal page for the back of her Sprinter van. And in order to outfit it properly for the dogs mm -hmm. and for the wheelchairs, we kind of needed that. Yeah. So that's what we've been working on today. And then, of course, I go to make eggs for breakfast like a good host would. And we didn't have any gas. Yeah. Our, you know, we have a gas stove and the propane was gone. So Rich had to go deal with that first. So it has been a busy day yeah. all the way around. And yeah. we now have time for you guys, which is good. Mm -hmm. And to talk about one of the things that, that we've been getting a lot of yeah. lately, inquiry-wise, is basically how disabled should you be to have a service dog? Uh, what is it that you should be looking for? I've had people tell me, oh, I get migraines. A lot of times when people tell me that they get migraines, it means they get some headaches sometimes. Therefore, they think yeah. they should have a service dog. And that's not the case. And I'm going to tell you why. But first, Karen, her real job when she's not doing dog stuff and whelping puppies and training dogs and all the fun stuff is nurse. She yeah. is an RN, an official RN. And for her, Rena, she, she knows a lot of the medical stuff. So she's the person I defer to when questions do arise. So Karen, talk to me about being disabled. Uh, so a disability uh, for uh, can change your life. Uh, so a disability that alters your ability to go outside, to lead a normal daily life in the public, in your home, uh, is one that you would need to mitigate with medical equipment and or medication and the support of medical physicians one or multiple or a team of medical physicians those that's the type of disability that you might consider a service dog for if you have one condition i got it oh it's eating the charging cord yeah <laughs> if you have one condition and it does not stop you from leading a normal productive life uh that you don't take regular medication for, that the that uh, you don't have, that doesn't have, um, that can't be mitigated with an early warning or early detection. Uh, um, for example, there are many, many medical conditions that uh, that people have, but they don't suffer life-threatening or daily limiting of your activities for that are well controlled with a daily medication, and um, they don't have a medication that they would take. The, the the it's controlled, so they don't they don't need a rescue medication or. They don't have symptoms that tell them that, that... Oh, he's oh, peeing. No. Sorry. Hold on. Karen's going to go and, uh, and deal with Fluffy. He had just peed outside, and he was like, I'm going to squat and pee on a mat. Yeah. So, so, yeah, we're just going to... She's going to do that. So, yeah, there are a lot of things that you could be diagnosed with. For example, if you're pregnant, you're not disabled because that's going to go away in nine months, right? Even though it might be a heart pregnancy because of your other disabilities or what have you, it doesn't make you disabled for that. Uh, next is the whole, you know, I get headaches versus I get migraines. Well, okay, so you get migraines. What do you want your dog to do? There are migraine alert response recovery dogs. You know, is that what you're looking for? There are, uh, you know, go and get the meds. You go and get help. Uh, you know, but... A lot of people want, uh, for example, I've had a lot of people who tell me they want a dog uh, who, because they fall down, to go get help. And what I tell them is get an Apple Watch because when you fall down, it'll alert your contacts and it'll alert the paramedics and give them your exact location. 
and that is much easier and much better than the you know let's spend 30 to 50 plus thousand dollars train up a dog to whenever you go down to go get help well at my house here my dogs can only go so far before they hit a fence and they can't go get help anymore so what what works out best is not to go get help if something happens that's not one of the things that my dogs are trained for because it's just not going to happen right so that's something that you do have to keep in mind okay so that's number one next and in apple watch even if you buy a new one every year it's four hundred dollars right and what ten dollars a month to be on your plan yeah. about like oh i fall yeah. i need a dog to come and and, and help out whenever i fall yeah. and then an apple watch is just <laughs> we changed out fluffy for uh for holstein oh, because holstein won't pee on him up that yeah. uh, <laughs> tasks like go get help scare me don't they yeah yeah because first with go get help yeah. is it's one thing if Karen and I are at the park together and it's go get Karen, but it's still a crowd of people, yeah. right? My, my Apple Watch, she's one of my emergency contacts on it. Yeah. So if I do go down, it'll alert everybody. It'll alert all my emergency contacts and give my exact location so she can come and get to me, right? If it's just go get a random stranger to help me. The random stranger is not necessarily, not necessarily going to understand what your dog is trying to do. May be, feel threatened by your dog approaching them. Um, oh, look, this dog know. needs a home. He was abused and, and they, abandoned. Yeah, and that might be the interpretation of why your dog's free and uh, not tethered to you. And, uh, you know, so uh, until you actually get voice boxes onto your dogs and your dog can actually communicate through his barks being translated in some like up. technology like up. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, which is that isn't a reality right now at all and isn't in the near future either so um, Don't let anybody tell you otherwise um, But that that is not a practical thing to have a service dog do Apple watch works much better uh, Well, what yeah, what if so. what if the or person didn't them. walk off and steal your dog. Okay, so that's always right. a possibility with the go get a rando yeah. for help, right? They can take your dog and walk off with your dog, right? Yeah. And you're, you're, you're out of commission. You can't help. What if it was worse? Well, what's worse than stealing my service dog? What if it was a, like a pedo, right? A pervert. Yeah. And he came over. Oh, my gosh, it's my sister, wife, girlfriend. Oh, I'm going to take her out to the car. And now you're kidnapped. And now you're in, sold into the sex slave business. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, that is actually a reality. Yeah. Um, uh, not to try to scare everybody, but that does happen. Um, and your dog is better trained to stay with you, uh, along with having the medical equipment of an Apple or Samsung watch. The watch is going to signify. It's going to notify. It's going to notify your next to kin or next to your emergency person that you fell, and uh, no. You're, you didn't respond and the dog it's better to train that dog to stay with you and try to uh, keep you calm or wake you uh, through tasks that have been trained than to send that dog to get help uh, out in public especially now about getting help in the house we've we've had stories where that's been very effective for a service dog within the home meaning go get Go get Karen, Karen go get yeah, Rich, go yeah. get Luke. And that's been very effective. That's been a very, very good task for a dog to do um, in home. Uh, so uh, just like go get your medicine, uh, especially if you have your medicine in the same container in the same place and you happen to be in another room and the dog has access to where your medicine is. If you're like closing your doors and whatnot, then the dog can't get into the, not unless you've taught your dog to open doors and that kind of thing. So that will also require you to have the proper equipment on your door so your dog can open the doors. Yeah. But um, it's not impossible. It can be done. Um, it, well, you know where it comes in handy is having a doggy door built in, right? Yeah. Dog, but okay, yeah. you have a doggy door built in, but now snakes can come into your house. Yeah. Right? Exactly. Um, or you have a doggy door come 
in, and again, if you guys have been to my house, you know that we have the dog yard and then we have the rest of it. So what if Rich is out with the cows past the dog yard and my dog can't get out there? Now, it was one thing whenever we had Arrow who could jump this oh, fence. he would jump, he would go. <laughs> right? Yeah. But that's not yeah. the case with any of the dogs I currently have, and I kind of don't want them to jump the fence. Yeah. So, you know, you're, well, okay, well, then I'm going to train a bark. Let's yes. talk about that. Oh my Don't train a bark alert. Why? Because what is a barking dog? A barking dog is an aggressive dog. No, he's alerting. Find another way to teach your dog to alert. Yes. Well, I don't pay attention to them. Well, then stop it. So your service <laughs> dog is not allowed to disturb the public. So what does a bark do? I think it disturbs the public. It disturbs the public. Every person in the public, whether they have a dog or not, gets disturbed by a barking dog, whether they interpret it as the dog needs something or, you know, but it, it does disturb. Your your service dog is supposed to be seen and not heard, or not even seen. The best compliment you have is when you get up from uh, a public transit or a restaurant and everybody's shocked that you even have a dog. That's how well behaved your dog was. That's how well tucked under and and, the, and your dog is alerting to your medical condition silently to you, not disturbing others while your dog alerts to your medical condition. So it doesn't make sense to have a dog that jumps on you to alert to your medical condition out in public. Uh, you know, what if you're in public transit and your dog needs to stand up and jump on you? Or, you know, what if you're on a plane and your dog needs to stand up and jump on you to... Alert. What if you're not paying attention, your dog jumps and you fall over? Or one thing that Karen and I was talking about the other day, uh, dogs, especially medical alert dogs, have alerted to people who aren't you because it smells the same or it smells different. And they're like, hey, that diabetic smell coming from you, it's coming from her now. Hey, I smell yeah. that same thing because they know, right. especially if you work with other trainers or if your dog has ever been with somebody else, something that could happen. So if your dog comes up to me and jumps on me and I fall over and break I bump my hip, head. Bump your head or break your hip. Bump, break your nose. You know, you get a gash. And your service dog are liable for that because your, your service dog was a danger, has put a higher being in danger, has harmed a higher being. And um, your service dog could be put down for that. Yep. Because whether it was intentional or not, your service dog harmed somebody else. And, and that is, uh, per the legal framework, a reason why a court system could say your dog does not deserve to live any longer. So think about that when you're teaching your dog to do something that could be, uh, you know, do alert, uh, you know, when, you're, when your dog has a natural alert that you have not bothered to train into something that's calmer. So. That, definitely, and a lot of times, it, first it looks bad, it's just like barking. Does barking work? I mean, technically, yes, but find another way in the whole, I, I don't pay attention to my dog and I push him away until he barks at me then you need to improve yourself. This yourself. is your dog trained to help you. Uh, a lot of handlers with medical disabilities uh, ignore their dog's alert because uh, they're too busy doing something else. Playing on the computer. Yeah. And Facebook. The dog is alerting them early for some medical condition where they could have taken medication early for and uh, and then the dog, they don't understand why the dog gets frantic when um, when they keep pushing the dog away. And then he's, he paws at him harder and harder or, or barks or starts barking. And then they do that frequently enough that they myelinate that behavior into the dog. And they don't even realize they've done that. And they can't get the gentle alert that they originally started with. And we, we see these problems. We have handlers come to us to fix these problems. All the time. All the time. Which is fine. Yeah. Because you don't know what you don't know, right? Yeah. And, and that's what we're here for. So we have some comments um, that have been coming up as we've been talking. Thank you for what you do to assist those with disabilities. You're welcome, Anne-Marie. Um, I like tasks like go get help scare me. Yep. And I want my dog to find rando people. Right, Amy? I agree. 
here we got a question my son is in a wheelchair and born with multiple cognitive limb abnormalities he has no other health issues would he qualify for having a service dog it depends, it depends. you have to see first what tasks amory would the dog do for your son right that's the first thing is you have to have a disability your son has a disability second your dog has to be task trained to mitigate that disability which means to help make that disability less bad okay okay and if your son okay you're out your son's out in independently with this service dog can he care for the service dog while he's out in his wheelchair independently or will he always be with another human so if the dog gives your son some more independence while he's out with another human say your son drops something instead of the other human picking it up the dog can pick it up say the do your son the dog can open uh push buttons for for um door openers for him so he can go in and out of doorways more independently those are some things that possibly a service dog could do could go fetch uh, a bag of you know a lunch bag of food or a bo water bottle or a medication bag um uh could go you know if you've got a a tablet or something that's in a you know a carrying type case you know these tablets could have like a handle type thing um so you know if it was left somewhere the dog could go fetch it and bring it to your son those are some items that i can envision that could possibly help him be more independent but the dog is not a health care giver for your son so the dog cannot babysit or human sit your son and you go away and <laughs> You know, Dude, I want one of those. <laughs> he's not a nanny dog. Mary Poppins? Uh, no. In a fur coat. Yeah, and what about the dog's needs? So somebody will still have to be responsible for the dog's needs, be available, so the son can't be left at home alone with, and not be able to feed the dog, uh, potty the dog, uh, you know, those type of things. The dog's needs have to be met. So the responsibility in that household needs to be, it needs to be a triad that learns and helps definitely you know yeah so. and and emory we're not saying you're thinking this no. but this is what we've dealt with before right so we just we need to make that clear is your doctor must agree that your dog the service dog would benefit and you both together come up with some tasks that the dog could do now yeah. well the dog makes me feel better the dog makes him feel better he's less lonely are not tasks that would be an emotional There's support emotional dog support. and right now the only benefit to having an emotional support dog is you can live with that emotional support dog in non-pet friendly housing not out to take that dog out into public emotional yep. support dogs were never intended for public service so what happened though was airlines were like well we feel bad for emotional support dog people so let's allow them on the planes and so they were giving them the same advantages as having a service dog and you're allowed to take it you were allowed to take an emotional support dog up in a metal tube in the sky not and go on a flight starting january no longer no which is fantastic so because it's it was ridiculous and it is not needed you can travel with what is it up to two service dogs up to two service dogs and you know what i tell you when we were at universal yesterday and they went on hagrid's ride and i was in charge of first i was in charge of siren then i was in charge of all of them but you know i only had siren's leash uh fluffy was in his stroller and ramsey was in his crate well in the the, the crate there it was hard because when i had siren the first time we weren't in the dot in the swap room so i had to use the restroom i had to go find karen and so i'm trying to maneuver in a wheelchair with two dogs it was hard it was hard. difficult right and it was difficult because of the crowds if it was just me it would have been fine and we were doing the same thing at epcot we were you know i was taking yeah. multiple dogs and we were working them a little bit with the wheelchair to see and working two dogs together is not easy it's not something that anyone should enter into easily it is a lot of work and to say well this dog's a mobility dog well candy does mobility for me jenga does mobility and alerts and gypsy is is working with the alerts but she does more like pick up mobility type stuff for me right and she's also really good her response and recovery is great yeah because she wants to be with me uh if something happens she's the one who is standing over me looking at me or lying down right beside me 
you know, so she is the one who was always right there with me for that. Because coming out of a dysautonomia spell is frightening, confusing, and disorienting, mm -hmm. right? So they all three have separate jobs. It does not mean that I take all three of them out with me everywhere. Nope. She usually only takes one service dog out with her. I do. Um, and giving the other two a rest. So, and that's, there's nothing wrong with that. But um, resting, it's actually advisable to actually have a, if you need your service dog all the time, your dog needs times to be off duty. So if, you, if you're the type of person, you're very active and you need a service dog all the time, you might want to seriously consider having a second service dog. So yep. each dog will have its own time for rest. Um, or so, daytime dog and a nighttime dog. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because you can't expect your daytime dog to be awake and coherent at night to help you out at night. Okay? Yeah. So your Bailey says, okay, I'm not the only one that thinks that way about the rando people mm -hmm. with the go get help. And then Amy says, I think the same way. Uh, Bailey also says, how do you set up the alert emergency contact? Bailey, if you have an Apple Watch, uh, message me later because I'm on my phone right now so I can't walk you through it. Or... Google. Just Google, Google and put down yeah. Apple Watch Notify Emergency Contact or Fall Alert, F-A-L-L, -L, yeah. like what time of year it was last month. Mm -hmm. uh, fall Alert, and that should be able to guide you through how to do that. And then she says, you're the best. Thank you, girl. Um, Amy says, barking makes me jump. Yep. Jennifer says, now I trained my girl to jump up and touch with two paws and then sit, but she's only eight pounds. Is that still bad? I wouldn't recommend it. Yeah. You know, first, Jennifer, you have an eight-pound dog that you trained up as your service dog, which is fine. I don't care how big your dog is. Eight-pound dogs. Shane has an eight-pound dog. She's awesome. Mm -hmm. But having an eight-pound dog, if you have an eight-pound dog who's constantly jumping up on you and sitting and jumping up on you and sitting and jump, she's just an obnoxious ankle biter is the uh, view that you're going to get from the yeah. public, honestly. Like, And I'm just going to be blunt because apparently that's how I roll. Uh, so you need to train her above and uh, beyond and it could yeah. be that she taps your knee with with, with um her not your knee i guess it would be your shin with her foot, foot right yeah. i like a nose touch is my favorite alert yeah. because i don't have to worry about how short the dog's nails is so jennifer your little eight pound dog comes up to alert me because i i have the same disability you have and the same things are going on and she comes up and she does that and you're okay with it but I'm not used to a dog and I flinch and I, I move because I have a little fuzzball who's like trying to bite me because yeah. she's jumping up on me, you know, or I kick her away just out of reflex. Now I've hurt your service dog. And you can't sue me. No. You can't sue her for hurting your service dog when your service dog approached her and jumped on her. And you if know, you say, I will make sure that never happens, let me tell you what happened yesterday at Universal is we had Ramsey and his owner, Natalie, who had come out from California for the day. Karen and Fluffy were there. Fluffy had a stroller, so sometimes he was walking, sometimes he was in the stroller. Uh, Jillian was there with Siren, and then I was there with Gypsy, who was at three. She was the oldest, and I had my wheelchair. So we were going. They were letting me clear the way for them in the wheelchair, and they were following up behind. They noticed three or four people, as they're walking down, reach out and pet the dog. Pet Gypsy. Pet yeah. Gypsy, because it was so crowded. Did they reach capacity yesterday? They reached capacity before 11 o'clock yesterday. So they reached sooner capacity. Than Saturday. Sooner than, yeah, the, it was. So it was crowded, yeah. right? So if you're like, my dog would never do that in a situation like that, it's going to happen because the people are right there, right? And if Gypsy would look with her mouth open and panting and a tooth would touch somebody, you now have a dog who bit somebody because people are stupid. So what we ended up doing, this is super fun, is, is they're, they're telling the person afterwards, don't touch it. She's a service dog, right? Yeah, so they told late. me they're about it, like right? And, and so as I'm doing it, this gypsy's on my left. My right is my steering hand because it's an electric chair, right? Is I saw somebody walk by. Just put the hand down to pet as she walks by, and I just karate chopped her. <laughs> and it reminds me, there was a Simpsons episode. I don't watch it, so it's been a long time. And Homer said, well, I'm not going to eat the donut. I'm just going to do this. And if that donut gets into my mouth, it's the donut's fault. And that's kind of how it is. I'm going to do this above my dog. And if your hand's in the way, he's going to get a karate chop. Mm -hmm. Because don't touch my dog. Oh, yeah. There you know, you so have COVID. Much. I don't know what you have. Yeah. Hi, peoples. People will steal your service dog and straight up walk away with them. 
They go get help from random people. It's terrifying because the high risk like that. Yeah, that or like as pedo people. Yeah, like perverts. Your and like service dog is one of the most expensive pieces of medical equipment you probably ever have in your lifetime. Yeah. If you calculate how much it costs to obtain the service dog, train that service dog, maintain that service dog uh, over the eight or eight years that you're going to have that service dog, you will realize you need to pre be uh, respecting and be prepared. Uh, yeah, be uh, more conscientious about the value of your service dog and not put your service dog in a position where he could be abducted and yeah. he or she abduct abducted and you'll never see him again. Yeah. So microchips don't save your dog from being uh, abducted. So Jennifer so. says, well, she just does one. So she jumps up and puts one paw on you. Well, then just have her sit in front of you and just tap you with her leg. There you go. And yeah. if she has the command and she knows the other, it is very easy to classically condition yeah. that she doesn't have to jump up and put one paw, that she just sits there and puts one paw on you or puts a paw on your foot or you know, licks your ankle bone. I don't care. Just, I don't like things. And then when people make excuses, well, it's okay because my dog can do this. Mm -hmm. I don't like a jumping dog. And we yeah. saw it. We, yeah. we saw it a couple times recently and apparently there's patches. So jumping is my alert. No, jumping is not your alert. Yeah. Jumping is because your dog jumps on you and you assume that that's an alert. It's not. Okay. An alert has yeah. to be task trained. Yes. If your dog just magically picks up on it, you still have to train that response. Yeah. And if your dog magically just comes up to you and so, sits and blocks, you still can shape them. If something is, if your do dog, if you think your dog did something naturally, can you back it up with a pulse ox reading of a heart rate level or a saturation level of your oxygenation level or um, the fact that you did develop a migraine two hours later or um, a glucometer reading? Can you back it up with some objective measuring tool? You know, uh, was it an inter interruption of a self-mutilating behavior or interruption of a, um, of a uh, uh, escalating anxiety um, uh, reaction uh, that, you know, before you actually had a panic attack or breathe, which can be exhibited in many very serious physical um, uh, ways, like disruption of your breathing, uh, you know, self mutilating or scratching or tapping or, um, you know, so did some one of those things, you need to be writing a diary of that. And if so, that happened then you know your dog was interrupting that. Therefore, whatever natural thing your dog did, you can classically condition that into a touch or a boop or a boop. You know, <laughs> boop a snoot. Pop, you know, and and then it it becomes a task. But because you don't know what randomly the dog interrupted, are you gonna go take something to low, to bring your sugar up and then end up with a high sugar without ever checking your sugar if you're a diabetic? Or are you gonna take migraine medication when you really didn't develop a migraine? So this process takes some time where you're actually going to suffer the problem before you actually, the dog starts mitigating the problem. Do you understand what I'm? <laughs> Yeah. At, yeah. So, well, and then yeah. the other thing, the other thing you have to look at is, does the dog do that when you are feeling fine? Right. Because and if my dog is I'm jumping saying. on me as an alert and I think it's an alert, right. And then the dog's jumping on me and it's not an alert and he's jumping on Karen and it's not an alert and he's jumping on Rich and it's not an alert. That is not an alert. That is just an obnoxious dog. Yeah. Jumping on you when he's hungry, jumping on, you know, just jumping randomly. You check your sugar, your sugar's fine. And the dog was jumping on you. You check your, you know, I mean, just when your dog was supposed to be alerting for low sugars and now the dog is jumping just randomly, then you know that's not alert, alert. Exactly. So that's what I'm trying to get at. It is better to task train that dog from the beginning than to take something natural that you don't know what it was for. Yeah. And so a lot of people think, oh, he naturally does it, so he's a better dog. Is he really naturally doing it? Or did, did it just randomly... He happened to do that, and then you just 
coincidentally had that other issue come up later uh, uh, or come about you know that medical problem just happened to be we don't know but it's better to have task trained and to and if it was a natural to test it you know with objective medical devices so yep okay so other comments you guys are the best dog trainers thank you um, Jennifer says she'll try to switch to nose or paw. I just, I like it better and yeah. it's setting you up for success. Uh, and her. So a lot of times all you got to do is classically condition whatever you want to whatever the dog's doing. And how you do that is the new comes about two seconds before the old, old. right? So if you want that, you need to pair it up with what it is that you want them to alert to. Uh, here's another thing that's been annoying me. Yeah. Is the, you can't train a dog to alert to blank you can't train a dog to alert to seizures you can't train a dog to alert to dysautonomy and pods you can't yes. train a dog to alert to diabetic was what they used to think they used to think they used yeah. to think that and then they found out oh wait a minute there are sense so guess what guys the whole well you can't train a dog to do that it might be true and it might not be true you don't know you dogs that we have recently since covid the scientific community has been amazed of what sense dogs can pick up. They have cross trained. COVID in your armpit. Yeah, they have cross trained a bunch of dogs that were already trained to identify cancers and other scent work. So it wasn't just dogs identifying human sense of cancers, it was dogs also that were identifying narcotics, it was dogs also identifying. Um, um, uh, were sugar uh, diabetes, diabetic alert dogs and uh, dogs that were just um, scenting uh, di identifying scenting in sports like um, like the natural oils and, and whatnot um, and they took these dogs they were a mixture of different dogs and they all were able to successfully identify uh, COVID-19 uh, so Dogs are amazing in identifying scents if you train them correctly. So the scent of your heart rate going up, that's a chemical change in your body. The scent of an actual real seizure But for, for the heart rate alert, because that seems to be one of the hot things, that and yeah. jumping up to alert and go get help. And like, and oh my God, what is gonna, we're gonna complain about next is gonna be the whole, my dog's off leash because he's tasking. So we're gonna do that in a second. We'll yeah. put a pin in it right now. Heart rate alert. Talk to me about that because I've had people tell me, oh, look, he's doing my heart, higher heart rate and it goes from like 70 to 80. Like what is a high heart rate? So uh, dangerous high heart rates are um, more d uh, medically, ones that are dangerous have to be defined by your doctor. But heart rates that sustain above 150 is what we call a dangerous high heart rate, meaning you need to get medical help or take a medication to reduce it. Okay. But above 150. Okay. So many of us will, with activity, with walking, like when I'm in the theme park and I actually wear my Apple Watch, <laughs> I keep forgetting that you have a charger here that you could charge it. Yeah, I do. <laughs> it's in my bathroom. Yeah. Um, but uh, when I'm walking, my heart rate's in 130s, 140s when I'm walking. And then when I sit down to rest, it should come down to below at least the, if it's hot out it will stay in the low one teens but it should come down to whatever my resting level is when you're sitting and resting okay okay so everybody's sitting and resting level can be can vary but more most people when they're sitting and resting their resting heart rate should be less than a hundred okay and there's nothing wrong if your resting heart rate is less than 60. That's not a problem for, unless you have symptoms. Uh, so less than 60 heart, resting heart rate is only a problem if you are symptomatic with it, meaning you have shortness of breath and you're diaphoretic and-, and Diaphoretic you know, or diabetic? Diapher, uh, sweating. Oh. Sweating because your heart rate's too low. Um, <laughs> yeah. techie things. I'm sorry. <laughs> but so, and also high heart rates, are not dangerous unless they're sustained and you have symptoms. Again, you have to have symptoms, meaning you're having a hard time breathing, you're having a tar hard time catching your breath, or 
you're um, sweating uh, and or you start tremoring uh, so and you should have a rescue medication for that or a plan to uh, address that from your doctor like lay down and uh, so to lay down or stop moving to uh, your doctor nine times out of ten these doctors want to know is your blood pressure dropping or going up when your heart rate goes up because dysautonomia their blood pressure usually drops and that's what causes them to pass out when their heart rate goes up but other people the blood pressure goes up that means they're your um uh and the doctor may have a medication for you to take to bring the blood pressure down um because a high blood pressure with a high heart rate can mean a lot of a lot of things so uh so you need to be working with a physician when you're making the physician needs to say here's the plan if your heart rate's this or your and you i want you to take your blood pressure and this is what i want you to do if your blood pressure is fine this is what i want you to do if your blood pressure is low this is what i want you to do and you you can have different alerts for a doll or you can just have your dog do a generic alert something's wrong which tells you to take your blood pressure or check your pulse ox or whatever so if your apple watch is telling your heart rate is up is it sustained because your apple watch will say how long it's up you know and usually um your dog your so this needs to be worked with this is not something that we work with independently without you and your doctor working with it. My doctor doesn't believe me, so it's okay, because I really have Then it's not a medical disability. If your heart rate's in the one teens and 120s sporadically, everybody has that. It's not, you know, and then that's the problem with having an Apple Watch nowadays, is everybody's, oh my gosh, I have tachycardia. You know, and, and but, but everybody's heart rate varies tremendously. So the nice so. thing too with wearing the Apple Watch is it checks it periodically throughout. Yeah. And so I was able to, I'm able to go and look back and then I'm able to give that information you can to my doctor. That to your doctor. And yeah. then he looks at it and then he can change up my meds or figure right. out like I'm feeling really wonky. Oh, I need to check that yesterday whenever I wasn't feeling great. Yeah. And see if it shows anything. I did find I do have a pulse ox in my bag. And your it. doctor told you to take your blood pressure when, when it, and because it it's was important to know because he can't. 130 over 70. Yeah, so so it wasn't low. No, nope, it, it was fine. So it was fine, and so he would tell her to do something different for a normal blood pressure versus a low blood pressure, and it's important information because they, it they, it works together. Um, your doctor doesn't want to prescribe you or tell you to do something that's going to uh, lower your blood pressure further, uh, or um, and, and if your blood pressure is low, your doctor wants to be able to correct that before you faint before you pass out basically yeah um so you if you are training your dog to do multiple kinds of alerts what i don't uh, so if you're going to do multiple types of alerts what i tell people is pick the top three things that you want yeah. your dog to work on right yeah. and then you're not going to have press my, touch my left knee for gluten touch yeah. my right knee for diabetic yeah. touch my elbow for uh for tachycardia you know go down my throat if it's something i shouldn't yeah. eat you pick one, pick, right? Yeah. You pick the worst thing that you have to deal with and you work with that. And if your dog magically picks up on something else, then you have to check, okay, is it the diabetes or is it the uh, syncope, right? Which one is it that my dog's alerting to? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and if it's something different, you know, like gluten, you could do gluten and diabetic because yeah. they're separate. They're separate, yeah. But your dog is not a nurse, Right? right your dog is not mary poppins your dog is not a doctor in a fur suit your dog is a dog so and it's your responsibility to follow up with you know what that dog is alerting for so here we have uh for here's a uh, personal example if holstein were to alert for gluten well he's retired now but um i still haven't trained ross to alert for that and i can start actually scent work on um, Fluffy now. But uh, if you were to, I would ask Holstein to alert for the gluten. That's how I trained him. I have him check food. I don't have him smell around my, my environment and alert me if gluten's in the environment. That's not how I've trained Holstein. And that's because 
gluten's only dangerous to me if I put it in my mouth and swallow it. So therefore I have him check it before I put it in my mouth and swallow it. So it's okay for gluten to be in my environment. Um, Barry appreciates that. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I have him check the, check the food uh, and he has a alert, which I had to change from a paw to a touch with his nose, which, um, which was much gentler. Uh, so I don't have him checking everybody. He, it's not acceptable for Holstein to go up to Vicki and say, uh, your food has gluten or to go up to Barry and say, your food has gluten. So, um, so that is just one example of your dog. It's not okay for your dog to generalize, um, your condition on everybody else. So, Everybody. Yeah, Hol Holstein does not stop or or so it's all all on command. So and the here's the other kicker I've seen people change their lives and become more limited in what they're doing because they have a service dog. Talk to me about that. <sighs> A service dog is supposed to free you and enable you to move about the world more easily, not keep you more um, afraid of the world, not keep you in inhibited from going out, inhibited from um, being independent. It's not supposed to make you more dependent. So, uh, and... That's why we keep emphasizing work with your doctor. Yeah. Um, you should be, your service dog should not make you m more afraid of other people, more afraid of the p general public, more afraid of, um, of going places. Then your service dog is not mitigating your disability. That means your disability needs to be dealt with in the medical world, you need to work with your doctor better to to find uh, more mitigation through medicine or through other therapies until you get to a point where actually a service dog could help you be more independent and less dependent. You shouldn't be dependent on the service dog to uh, watch your back all the time to how can I put this nicely <laughs> just be blunt your service dog is not there to be a protection dog yeah. and people's interpretation of a protection dog is my service I want my service dog to go check my house for intruders I want my service dog to uh, attack somebody if they walk up from me behind or bark uh, they don't actually want them to bark they want them to be um oppressive not oppressive uh, be intimidating to others yep. so um and so therefore we get people who ask for us to train um german shepherds malinois dogs that are um more intimidating looking it's because they want the general public to be more intimidated by their dogs and um it has the opposite effect and uh they don't realize that a golden actually produces oxytocin in people when they see it and it actually makes people less intimidating around you although the people are trying to pet your dog all the time but usually they yeah. don't that was ridiculous yeah. yesterday yeah. man but, that uh, never happens Apparently she looked extra floof. She, she did look extra floofy. <laughs> Wait till they see what we have coming. <laughs> oh my gosh. But, um, so, uh, so, your dog should not be attacking or threatening other people independent of a command. Even and, if so. And even if so, it should only be a bark 
and not a attack, not a. And the service yeah, dogs yeah. are a not service personal dog, protection dogs. Yeah, that's so they're to totally get. separate. Yeah, so if so. you have a service dog yeah. and you want weirdos to not come up to you and you want that, you cannot train a bark growl command to that service dog. That would be a separate dog. Right. Because as a nurse who works the night shift, it can be a little bit scary coming home at night for Karen yeah. and for some of her friends and some of her other nursing buddies. And, you know, like, a protection dog might not be a bad thing, but, but... It's not my service dog. Yeah, I want to be your service dog. The dog cannot be, uh, so, and even if you do have a protection dog and you're not a police officer, if your dog ever bites anybody, whether it be on command or not, it is harm to higher being. And what did we say earlier? That's not a good thing. That that your dog according to the court uh your dog is harmed a higher being and a court system can decide that your dog is, no longer deserves to live and it's out of your hands to make that when the court makes that decision because your dog ha harmed somebody else uh and it doesn't it doesn't matter that that person was trying to harm you uh uh your dog is not supposed to harm others. There's no stand your ground with your dog. <laughs> stand your ground. That only applies here in Florida to guns, <laughs> not to cool. your dog. No. <laughs> so, no, but. So yeah, but, so yeah. If, if you do, it is not a service dog. Do not train that as yeah. a task. And yes, I have pay, had people ask me, I want to train that. Them. No, when you do that, no longer a service dog. Yeah. Sorry, Charlie. So That's the way the ball bounces. If you have, problems with people in public your dog can block can cover uh, but not bark or not growl or that's block or, not bark yeah not growl or threaten others in any way that's not a you can't we're not going to do that we're not going to train that and we're not going and it's not prop it's not appropriate for a service dog to be trained to do that and we're not going to train your dog to search your house what is your dog going to do once it searches the house? You, that's, again, training a dog to bark or to attack. And that's not what a service dog is uh, trained to do. So, um, and that's not a medical, uh, that's not uh, mitigating a medical disability either. No. So, that you've, you've reached a different realm with that dog um, when, you, when you're t training that. There's no medical disability in, in teaching your dog to search the house and, and attack somebody. Because <laughs> you know so, why, and here's my thing, is you could just leave the dog at home, and if someone breaks into your house, your dog would bark, bite, carry on, and be a deterrent. Yeah. Instead, you're taking your dog out with you, and then coming home and saying, check my house for bad guys. Yeah. And it feeds into the yeah. whole, the world is out to get me, and the world is not out to get the, you. The world's not out to get you, and if that's, uh, so, it's... Having a service dog requires you to work with your medical team uh, hand in hand. Yep. Yep. Any other questions? Sorry. Yes, we have a physician patient relationship. Uh, and your service dog. I'm a military spouse trying to own or train my dog. Uh, I have anxiety and panic attacks with physical symptoms right now i live in a remote area and it's impossible to get a pcp so it's hard to have a physician to help me and be on board so i'm not in the military i've never been in the military neither has yeah. rich but there has to be a doctor on base right so yeah there's they if you have trouble getting a primary care provider that's a pcp um uh the military has programs where you're allowed to uh obtain one that is not part of the military base, and you need to tap into um, that uh, uh, exception uh, program or whatever. There's uh, paperwork, or you can get an exception uh, through Tricare or whatever um, the system is uh, to see get obtain a primary care provider outside of the military base or system. So. Um, look into that and and get yourself a primary care provider uh uh there's a lot of telehealth programs nowadays yeah so you can uh, you see that person one time and then you're allowed to to communicate via telehealth afterwards so 
even in a rural community. And, you know, not that every doctor's the greatest. I have had doctors who tell me that I'm faking. Yeah. But that's where Ask I have had multiple doctors because I got diagnosed at 19, which means I had at least 10 years of not knowing why I was passing out. I'm in my 40s now, so I've had over 20 years. I've had doctors even after I got the diagnosis who have told me I'm faking. Mm -hmm. And then I'm doing it and seeking attention because I need attention. Yeah, that's why I do it. This yeah. is before Just social media, keep right? getting, change doctors. Yeah, so you, so you can change body. doctors, yeah. but there was also a time meds weren't working. Yeah. The dog was. So yeah. I still have the diagnosis. I still have... You know, the doctor records saying what's going on and what I have. And I have those. Mm -hmm. I have a copy of those that I could put into a training binder. Mm -hmm. But now I can scan and put on the computer. I can print up something from my sign in to the doctor online thing saying this is what I've been diagnosed with. And then I can run from there. Like, Dr. T, I don't have another appointment scheduled for him unless something happens because right. I'm running good right now. That's good. You know? Yeah. And, and yeah, so, so you know, like, you, you might not, but for, um, if you have anxiety and panic attacks with physical symptoms, I, I, personally, I, I would be definitely having a doctor on board. Yes, you need to have a doctor on board, and you need to make sure that uh, not only... So the service dog can can only help you so far. The service dog can't uh, is not a doctor. So you need we need to be you need to be working with a doctor with a medical professional along so we can uh, task train the dog to mitigate your disability appropriately. That means you might be on medication. You might be changing medications. You know um, and uh, and. It might be a combination of the dog uh, helping you with uh, not doing self-mutilating or, or doing some deep pressure therapy to help get you to a calmer level where you can take a medication uh, or get you to a calmer level where you can find an exit, uh, that type of thing. So, um, but it has to be, you have to be working with a, some kind of medical professional along with this. Uh, we can't just be uh, helping you train a service dog because you self-diagnosed. That's yeah. that. That's, that's scary. Not, yeah, that's it's not legal. <laughs> you can't self-diagnose yourself with a disability. Um, so here we so. got Jessica said thanks for all the info. You're both a wealth of knowledge. I get asked these type of questions from clients pretty often, and it's great to have some feedback for them. That's awesome, Jessica. That's what we're here for. And then we have, teledocs are popular right now? Yes, they are. My mother was in the military 21 years. Certain docs will not recommend service docs for certain conditions or ages. And if your mom was in the military for 21 years, I'm sure that was what it is in the past. But people are usually a little more progressive moving forward. Yes. Uh, and if one doctor won't, you can see if you can find another one that will. Uh, we were just talking, because being doctory stuff over here, Miss mm -hmm. Karen, Nursey Girl. Mm -hmm. uh, we were talking about, you know, you do have to be adamant to get the care and the help that you deserve, but you also have to watch, you know, you see some of these house shows and everything else where the person, you know, keeps going until they get a diagnosis, even though the diagnosis might not be the right diagnosis and now it's part of their permanent record, you know? So sometimes if every doctor that they see is telling them that they don't have an issue and they're adamant they do, you might want to look and see what's going on. Yeah. Uh, Tanya says, my apartment complex says I can't give them a letter from a doctor. My doctor has to complete and fax their forms. Okay. Yeah. Then that's what do you it. need to do. Yep. Yep. So, so yeah, there's a lot. And we're wrapping up because we're at yeah. 622 already. Wow. Right? Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, but there, there's a lot that can be done. There's a lot that we have to watch for because stuff. You want your service dog to help you not make you more disabled. True. Very true. So, and you can't, your service dog cannot replace human help. Cannot be your, pers your personal... Uh, nurse yeah so very important to uh, to work with your health care provider and to have realistic 
uh, expectations of what a service dog can and cannot do for you. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I've had people come and they have a list 20 tasks long. No, then you need to put it in order. And then what we're going to start doing. Oh, I didn't mention it yet. Ha <laughs> ha. There was no grand announcement. We have a new program. And what it is, is it's a three month board and train program. And why we are doing this is whenever I had the dogs with me up in Missouri for two months, seven weeks, not even two full months. They came so far and did so amazing that I thought... You know, both of the owners of the dogs that we had up there had done a lot to prep them and to do well with them, for me to do well with them. But if I would have had a little bit more time, we could have pretty much polished them off and they would have been done done. So what we put together is a three-month board and train. Mm -hmm. In addition to our five-week board and train that we currently have, the pricing is all up on the website. You can go to heart, soul, letter K, number nine dot com or heart, H-E-A-R-T letter k number nine dot com that's our website too and you can see what what we have right uh what the programs are but we do have a three month board and train uh which considering some programs only take dogs in for five or six weeks and i know where i can get a dog in five weeks i'm excited for the three month program because for some dogs this is going to be the answer and it and that's what i want you know, I want to be able to have that, that we can offer it. And we're also offering it through Hope Service Dogs. However, mm -hmm. we're only offering it to the dogs that we have bred through Hope Service Dogs. Any Hope program is only for the dogs that we have bred. Right. That's it. Yeah. Service dog or pet dog, because we do have some pet dog uh, yeah. programs. But we want that. We want the awesomeness that is our training mm -hmm. to be able to go and help more people. Okay? So... Uh, that's it. We have Christmas coming up this week. We hope you guys have a very Merry, Merry Christmas, Christmas or whatever yes. holiday you're celebrating this time mm -hmm. of year. And uh, we will be, I will be here next week. Karen will be working next week. Yeah, I'll be working. Sad, Vicki. Um, saving lives. Right. <laughs> Always saving lives there. So if you live in Gainesville, don't do anything stupid and yeah. end up in the hospital. Yeah, I don't want to see you. <laughs> yeah. Karen hates seeing people she knows at work. Yeah. It's the worst. Okay. So otherwise... <coughs> I have a very Merry Christmas. Very that was not COVID. That was just a cough. Uh, and no puppies yet. No Lucy, no Lita coming into heat. Yeah. It looks like we're looking at January. We are switching up their food. Mm -hmm. We will tell you more about that later. Later, yeah. Um, as it actually happens and as we see what the difference is. But I have two bags that just arrived today. So Good. Um, all of the three breeding girls will be switched to it. Good. Or are already switched to it. So we'll see how that goes. Otherwise, you guys enjoy your evening. Enjoy your time. Uh, and I will catch you guys on the flip side. Bye. <laughs>